Okay. Um, hi, I'm Nalen Blake, and um, one thing I'll say is I, uh, I run a graduate program, so I have a lot of classes, and I know it's only like the bad kids that sit in the back of the room. <laughs> so take a moment, you good kids, and filter on in and fill up the seats here. <laughs> Get comfortable. Um, uh, Welcome to our fourth of seven evenings um, in conjunction with uh, Free Love Toolbox. And um, I just quickly want to say that um, the show is uh, really about providing a kind of meeting place and place of connection. Um, for people um, to think about ideas around liberation and freedom and sexuality, um, and also to honor um, and, and explore and hopefully complicate a little bit the history of um, YBCA. So it's really a show that could not have happened in any other location, not only because of the reference to our neighborhood, um, but also to what this place is administratively and, um, and conceptually. So I'm really thrilled and I feel really lucky to have had the opportunity um, to uh, you know, be asked to show here and be able to put the show together. Um, and, uh, and particularly to be able to bring in all of these people whose work I respect immensely and whose um, projects have done so much to inform my own way of thinking about making things. Um, and two of those people are gonna be presenting tonight, Richard Meyer and Lolita Wolf. Um, and to just give you an idea of like how the evening is going to go, um, uh, we're going to start out with um, Richard's presentation, um, and then we're going to take a quick break. It'll be about um, 10 to 15 minutes while we reconfigure the space uh, for the second performance. So during that time, we ask you to hang out, walk around. Um, and uh, I think we will probably be ending a bit early. I don't think we'll go the full two hours. You never know. Things might get crazy. But, um, but you know, I, I think we'll, I, I think it'll be a, a relatively um, quick paced evening. So um, with that, I wanna, uh, give you over to Betty Sue Hertz, who is the um, chief curator here and the person responsible for bringing me in. Thanks, Betty Sue. Let me, let me lower this, oh my God. All right, hi, um, welcome. Welcome to Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Welcome to Free Love Toolbox and um, to this wonderful evening um, with Richard Meyer, Naylan Blake, and Lolita Wolf. And I, um, I'm just gonna introduce Richard. Richard Meyer is the Robert and Ruth Halperin Professor in Art History at Stanford University, a post he took up this past September, and we're very, very happy because he's now living in San Francisco rather than Los Angeles. Prior to that, he taught for 15 years in the Department of Art History at the University of Southern California, where he also directed the Visual Studies Graduate Certificate Program and the Contemporary Project. He is the author of Outlaw Representation, Censorship, and Homosexuality in 20th Century American Art, which is like a art classic already, which was awarded the Charles Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship from the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. Last year, Richard Guest curated the exhibition Naked Hollywood, Ouija in LA at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. 
and he has two books forthcoming in early 2013. What was contemporary art, which I remember talking to you about a while ago, so I'm really happy it's coming out. <laughs> uh, published by MIT Press, and he's also co-edited with Catherine Lord, Art and Queer Culture, which will appear in April from Fiden Press. So please uh, help me uh, to warmly welcome Richard Meyer. Thanks, Betty Sue, and also um, thanks to Nayland for doing this beautiful show and opening it up to various uh, communities um, in the way that he has, and also um, to Betty Sue and the Yerba Buena Center for sort of having the vision to um, to make to make such a project um, come um, become a reality. So Nayland, I don't know if Betty Sue told me or Nayland did, but someone said um, that we had to think about showing show and tell. And um, I'm, not, I'm not bringing an actual object because I don't have access to it, but if I did, I would be showing, in, I would be showing you um, these match boxes from the toolbox, um, the George Washington Leather Daddy, um, and I just um, wanted to sort of set the stage by looking at these. Sure. Can, is that better? Did you not hear anything I said? I'm not going to. OK. Anyway, this is my show and tell. And the, the talk starts um, with a quote from Walter Benjamin. Here's the quote. <clears throat> Here it becomes evident that the hallmark of the new type of researcher is not the eye for the all-encompassing whole, nor the eye for the comprehensive context, but rather the capacity to be at home in marginal domains. To be at home in marginal domains. That's from an essay called The Rigorous Study of Art by Walter Benjamin. <clears throat> now it's my me. Um, I have always been at home in marginal domains, or rather in the movement from marginal domains to mainstream ones and back again. A gay sex club I used to know in Manhattan was located around the corner from the headquarters of the College Art Association, the CAA, the leading professional organization for art historians and artists in the US. Whenever I walked past either the CAA or the sex club, I thought at least for a moment of the other institution. There was something peculiar and pleasurable in this juxtaposition, this secret association between the space of academic art history, which in a way was one of my spaces, and that of queer sex culture, which was another of uh, the spaces that I um, in inhabited, inhabit, um, so if I'm lucky. Uh, I, sometimes, <laughs> I sometimes think of the proximity between the CAA and the club as a metaphor for the relation between art history and queer studies, for the ways in which each field might unexpe unexpectedly pierce the other's terrain. How, in other words, might um, the art historian's attention to visual images inflect the critical study of sexuality, and how conversely might a scholarly focus on sexuality shift the concerns and commitments of art history? So these are the sorts of questions that I've been concerned with in different ways for a long time, and that I think um, uh, speak to or, or are inspired by artists like Nayland and artists, and specifically by Nayland's uh, work. When Walter Benjamin wrote The Rigorous Study of Art in 1933, he was almost certainly not thinking of homosexuality as one of the marginal domains to which the new type of art historical researcher should attend. But Benjamin was thinking of various forms of visual production, in his case, architectural drawings and stage designs that had been marginalized within the field of art history in favor of painting and sculpture. And he was arguing for a scholarly method that would include what he called an esteem for the insignificant, an esteem for anonymous works and overlooked details for the obscure and the non-canonical. So that's where my show and tell of the matchboxes from the toolbox comes in. Like the archivist of queer history, the art of Nayland ba Blake, sorry, the art of Nayland Blake pays loving attention to overlooked materials and outdated references, to signs and messages 
this is sort of weird because I'm showing you like things that are in the room. I didn't know that I would be actually lecturing in this space. So um, I thought we would be like, I'm really happy. The whole talk will work much better in this space. But I had sort of imagined an auditorium with none, no art, uh, none of Nalen's art in the, anyway. Um, so you can look at the image or you can look at the, at the, at the walls. Uh, 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 like, the, uh, like the archivist of queer history, Neyland pays loving attention to overlooked materials and outdated references to signs and messages to codes and clubs that, while often intensely pleasurable, were rarely meant to be fully public or universally accessible. In what follows, I look more closely at the mural that lies at the heart of Blake's brilliant installation and at the history that precedes its latest revival here at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And I have to apologize because those of you, I wasn't able to attend Gail Rubin's lecture. I was not in town. So I'm hoping if you, those of you who were at that lecture, um, I'm hoping that I'm not going to be saying the same thing or if it is the same thing, I hope that you really liked what she said. Um, <laughs> A gay motorcycle bar, I don't know what I did with my water. Can you guys hear me okay now? Oh. A gay motorcycle bar called The Toolbox opened in 1962 at the corner of 4th and Harrison Streets in San Francisco. Popular among the city's growing number of gay bikers and leathermen, the bar often had a row of motorcycles parked alongside Harrison Street, such as in this photo by Henry Lelou. Um, who actually took photographs of a huge range of different gay bars and spaces in, um, in 60s San Francisco. Um, uh, so ev uh, even from outside then, passers-by and potential patrons could glean a sense of the bar's appeal and preferred clientele. In 1964, when Life magazine published an article entitled Homosexuality in America, the lead photograph for the story spread across two pages was an interior shot of the toolbox. And the subheading reads, a secret world grows open and bolder. Society is forced to look at it and, to tr and try to understand it. The picture featured about a dozen patrons of the bar, almost all of whom wear black leather, biker jackets, sometimes accessorated with silver studded leather caps or black sunglasses. Several of the men hold bottles of beer, no mixed drinks or cocktail glasses here. A young man in the right mid-ground enters the bar from the street, thereby piercing its dark interior with a blast of a bright daylight. A mural on the far wall of the bar portrays a long row of men in black jackets against an unmodulated white backdrop. A couple of the men wear collared shirts and narrow black ties. One sports a helmet and goggles. Um, and, and by the way, this is, I'm just going to say, I'm just observing this woman, and with her and other women on the arm behind me, they're turning towards the door because they, they're in the wrong place, according to the logic of the mural. And so they are leaving. Um, like the real men standing beneath the mural, uh, the men represented in the painting orient their bodies and gazes in a range of different directions. The visual logic of life's photograph sets up a kind of call and response between the figures in the mural and the patrons of the bar, between the clearly resolved, if two-dimensional, men in the upper half of the photograph and the three-dimensional, if rather shadowy, men below. And, um, the historian Martin Meeker, who's, who's here tonight actually, and who's written the most extensive account of the, um, the taking of this photograph and of the impact of this image uh, on a whole generation of gay and lesbian um, Americans who in, in effect were inspired to move to San Francisco or at least to think about uh, the fantasy of, or of San, uh, the destination of San Francisco as queer as a result of this image. But, um, but that what, I was going to tell you something that Martin discovered and now it's, um, if I read, okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, yes, what Martin, one of the things he says was that the men were sort of, because at this point, if you were rendered visible in Life magazine as a homosexual, it, you might 
um, lose your job, be disinherited, you, you know, you would be uh, considered criminal. And so the men were basically promised that they wouldn't be visible, that the photograph would be shadowy. And as it turned out, because the photograph was so large, they were actually more recognizable, the men, uh, in the photograph than had been anticipated or then they'd been led to believe they would be. And generally, and you'll see some other photographs from this, I'll show some other photographs from this spread. Um, generally, the homosexual, the figure of the homosexual, which as Martin Meeker points out, in Life Magazine's uh, account in 1964 is always a white and male figure, never female or a person of color. But the figure of the homosexual is almost always seen in silhouette, in shadow, or from behind. Very rarely do you get a, a head-on, um, well-lit uh, picture. And um, that's just something I wanted to do, put out there from the beginning. Um, the mural, okay, the visual, okay, the mural was painted in 1963 by Chuck Arnett, a San Francisco artist who was also a bartender at the Toolbox. And I'm just showing you here two other images, uh, bar-related uh, works that by Chuck Arnett. Um, this is like a little, uh, it's actually very small, I think, card uh, um, at promoting group party Thursdays at the Why Not Bar, which was an even earlier, I love that name for a bar, an even earlier in 1966, and, and Arnett has um, taken the enamel buttons that a lot of the white men in the city put on their hats um, and sort of made that into the, as you can see, you see the names of the different artists whose work is going to be for sale at the auction. So just to give you a sense that he, that Arnett, among, uh, among a host of artists, um, was very involved with the bar world in the 60s and the leather world, and it isn't that he just did this mural. He did other bar murals and also other kinds of posters and promotional materials for the bar scene, and it's also interesting to me that he worked at, um, uh, at the bar itself. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Arnett, in fact, appears in the life photograph. So this figure, I believe, the third from the right, in the full leather and, and profile with the beard is Chuck Arnett, the, the painter, uh, the maker of the mural. Arnett, in fact, appears uh, in the life photograph. Um, although life therefore features both Arnett and his mural, the artist is never identified by name, either in the photographic caption or in the accompanying article. And again, this could be in part life's policy of, of, of sort of protecting um, um, the, 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 the subjects um, photographed, and it, it, but it was also very common. Um, one of the earliest gay bars was called the No Name Bar, and it was common to sort of want to avoid for legal and social and criminal, you know, possible uh, criminal reasons, avoid being named or identified as a homosexual, even uh, to the outside world, even as one was circulating very freely within uh, the confines of a subcultural, uh, of various subcultural spaces. Okay. Um, even as he stands among the men who patronize the toolbox, Arnett poses beneath the painted representation of those men he has created for their viewing pleasure. However unacknowledged at the time, the presence of Arnett in the photograph adds another layer of meaning to the dialogue that unfolds within it. In 1971, in the midst of the gay liberation movement, the toolbox closed. In 1975, the building that housed the bar was demolished. For some time after the raising of the bar, and the amount of time is various accounts range from a few weeks to as much as two years, but, so I don't, but for some amount of time after the demolition of the bar, a single wall of the original structure was left standing, the wall on which Arnett's mural was painted. And actually this, um, where the, the image that Nayland Blake has used for his recreation of the mural, you can see is a detail. It's this, it's the mural in ruins. Um, it's this, it's taken from this or a similar photograph probably by Michael Kelly. Um, or maybe by Henry Leloup, I think the caption said. Um, 
for a time after the demolition, a single wall with the mural on it was uh, left standing. Um, a 1975 picture by local photographer and occasional toolbox patron Michael Kelly shows the mural still marvelously intact beside an expanse of concrete blocks and collapsed metal beams of rubble and rocks and architectural debris. Arnett's mural, intended for the interior of a gay bar, has unwittingly become a public work of art that is no less visible to passing motorists and pedestrians than, say, the Harrison Street sign behind the detritus-strewn lot on which the bar once stood. You can see the sign for Harrison Street. And I kind of want you to remember all those motorcycles parked along Harrison Street in the 1962 photograph I showed earlier. Um, as kind of the... Um, the ghost of, or the, the legacy of the toolbox and the men, and actually some women who patronized it. Um, Arnett's mural, oh, I said that already, okay. It is almost as though the process of architectural dis demolition and reconstruction has itself paused before Arnett's mural, as if in hesitation or momentary, momentary refusal to tear down the picture. And I believe that what stands at 4th and Harrison now is a Whole Foods, I believe. So there seems to be a certain, um, I don't want to call it poetic license, but a certain um, sort of something very characteristic of our own moment um, in, in culture that, that where the toolbox once stood is now a Whole Foods. I am, in, um, I am an admitted latecomer to the story of the toolbox mural. By the time I moved to San Francisco in 1988, so anyway, this is not important, but I, I lived here during graduate school, so this is my second time living in San Francisco. But anyway, when I moved here in 1988, and, and actually shortly after I moved here, I met Nalen Blake, um, who was living here at the time too. Both the bar and, the, and its mural were long gone. Even though Nayland and I were here, the bar, the toolbox, and the mural were gone. By the time I saw Michael Kelly's photograph in 1998, 10 years later, a number of other queer scholars, namely Gail Rubin, Martin Meeker, Willie Walker, and the writer Jack Fritcher, had already excavated the history of the toolbox and its mural. I do not regret my belatedness, however, because the prior work of these writers has created an ongoing dialogue about queer history, one in which Arnett's mural, Life's article, and Kelly's photograph also participate. It is a history which remains ongoing, and I'm showing you here the cover of Martin Meeker's 2006 book, Contacts Desired, which traces the history of gay and lesbian communication networks in San Francisco from the 40s through the 70s, and includes, as I mentioned, uh, a groundbreaking chapter on the life um, layout, not just the, the toolbox mural, but the whole layout and its impact on readers and um, proto-gay and lesbian subjects at the time. Um, and that dialogue in, now includes Nayland's work. The, here's a picture of Nayland working on um, Free Love Toolbox. And it also includes um, a still ongoing circulation of the image. This is a photograph I snapped yesterday in Auto Erotica, which is a shop on 18th Street near, uh, near Castro that specializes in vintage porn and gay memorabilia. And so here is the Life magazine photograph of um, the men in the, uh, the bar patrons in the toolbox beneath the mural, um, now reproduced and framed in this shop on, on uh, 18th Street. Um, and they actually, I invited the guys who, the owner of the shop to tonight's lecture, but he's, anyway, he didn't want to come. Um, <laughs> According to Jack Fritcher, the appearance of the toolbox photograph in Life magazine marked a crucial moment, a kind of collective coming to consciousness for gay viewers in 1964. This is a quote from Fritcher. Thousands of queers in small towns who thought they were the only faggots in the world suddenly saw compliments of life that there was an alternative homo-masculine style. And actually this issue of a homo-masculine as opposed to a Nelly or effeminate gay male or male um, style of homosexuality is a very important part of the story, which I don't have time to get into, but I think is, is interesting, and maybe, anyway, we can talk about it or think about it later. Um, Martin Meeker has similarly argued that life's coverage of, quote, the gay world of San Francisco had the effect of advertising the city and the, its available resources to many an isolated homosexual, and in many cases the advertisement was alluring enough to encourage them to want to move to the city, end quote. 
that the photograph should have galvanized gay readers to move to San Francisco is not without a certain irony, given that Life's 1964 article insisted on homosexuality as pathetic and disgraceful. Listen, for example, to the magazine's description of the patrons of the toolbox. So this is from the, um, oops, this is from the, uh, one of the captions, or, or no, it's actually from the article itself, where they're taught the, the writer is talking about the men who patronize the toolbox. Um, These brawny young men in their leather caps, jackets, and pants are practicing homosexuals, men who turn to other men for affection. They are part of what they call the gay world, which is actually a sad and often sordid world." End quote. The anonymous writer of this passage aims to undo any sense of the gay world as a pleasurable space of difference by insisting that such a world must be sad and often sordid. In a similar, similar rhetorical maneuver later in the article, the apparent butchness of the men at the toolbox is revealed as just so much foppish premeditation. Quote, this is from the article, the efforts of these homosexuals to appear manly is obsessive in the rakish angle of the, ca of the caps in the thumbs boldly hooked in belts, end quote. While these men may look like bikers and tough guys, they are, life assures its readership, just a group of Nelly homosexuals whose manliness must be choreographed down to the last thumb gesture. Other photographs in the same article underscore the flamboyant problem posed by the male homosexual, and as I mentioned, all the homosexuals in Life magazine in 1964 are male and white, um, so far as we can tell from the shadowy or, or rear view that we get of them. But anyway, other photographs in the same article underscore the flamboyant problem of the male homosexual, whether he circulates in Pershing Square or Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles, in the village in New York City, or south of Market in San Francisco. And those are the three cities that are featured um, uh, prominently in the article. And it's a, the article becomes almost a kind of tour of the gay worlds of these different cities. This is part of the tour of New York, takes us to the park in Washington Square, and this photograph, which is captioned as follows. Two fluffy sweatered young men <laughs> stroll, that's why I'm wearing a fluffy um, jacket tonight. Two fluffy sweatered young men um, stroll in New York City, ignoring the stare of a straight couple, and straight is in scare quotes. Flagrant homosexuals are unabashed by reactions of shock, perplexity, disgust, end quote. The homosexual, as I mentioned, is, is almost always shown from behind or in silhouette. And in this picture, therefore, what we see most conspicuously is not the flamboyance of the gay couple, but the homophobia of the straight man and women, woman who face the camera. So in a way, I like to think of this photograph as really kind of of the straight couple and kind of about their perplexity, shock, and disgust, and in a way about Life magazine's own perplexity, shock, and disgust in the face of um, the gay world. Um, the gay world of Los, so this is part of the gay world of New York, and the gay world of Los Angeles, for its part, is first represented by an image of an attempt of attempted police entrapment. Uh, the caption reads, a policeman in tight pants, uh, sorry, a, t a policeman in tight pants disguise waits on a Hollywood street to be solicited by homosexuals cruising by in cars. And so there's the, one of the cars cruising by, presumably with a homosexual inside, who's going to solicit um, this tight pant disguised police officer. I didn't, uh, I didn't know that tight pants were a disguise, but I guess if you're a straight police officer or supposed, whatever, in 1964, that, um, and you're, and anyway. Um, uh, later in the article, we are offered uh, a shot of the so-called frantic hour when homosexuals face their last chance for a pickup that night. And um, this is, It's only Life magazine that sort of renders this the frantic hour, it seems to me. Although we've all been there at that hour. Or, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if frantic is exactly the word, but uh, certainly it can be stressful. Um, <laughs> a <f> <laughs> okay. I just didn't know they were a disguise. They're tight. But, um, I, I thought they were the cop's own pants that he had, but... A final aspect, um, and I'm going to sort of um, 
conclude with uh, pretty sort of with this part of the story. I have a few more pages, but a final aspect of the toolbox story that, dis that deserves discussion in this context involves the visitation of Leatherman to the site of the demolished bar. So um, this is the, oops, this is, I'm showing you the Life magazine mural. Um, but you could also think about um, the toolbox in ruins in the 1970s. According to Gail Rubin, Quote, when the building that housed the toolbox was torn down for redevelopment, old patrons came by to get bricks to keep as mementos. Rubin's account of bar patrons returning to the now demolished toolbox to claim a material remnant of the bar might be taken as a metaphor for the practice of writing queer history or of making queer art, a practice that requires the historian or the artist to, receive, to retrieve bits or bricks of a past that can never be fully reconstructed or recovered. One of the problems in tracing the history of homosexuality, writes the art historian Jonathan Weinberg, is that it is a history that was never meant to be written. In order to trace or write such a history, we must be willing to look at places, in places and at pictures that are not properly within the domain of conventional scholarly practice. The theater scholar David Roman, who's also my boyfriend, has argued that writing the history of queer culture means rethinking what counts as historical evidence and documentation. As Roman sees it, some of the most salient traces of queer experience are embedded, quote, in oral history, cultural memory, social ritual, communal folklore, and local performance, media that do not rely on print culture for their preservation. Because this archive often exists outside of official culture, it is frequently undervalued or even derided, end quote. Roman proposes that we attend more closely to queer legacies of performance and community-based art, to the ephemera and everyday life of gay and lesbian subjects. And I think of Nalen's work and of this show in particular as very much in that same spirit. The context in which I initially encountered the story of the toolbox um, echoes the sort of archival practice that Roman has in mind. I first saw Michael Kelly's photograph, and I know this is very difficult to make out, but th there's a, this is um, the, that, that Henry Leloup photograph I showed you, the Life magazine photograph, and then um, some other images where I think the men are identified above in um, the men who are standing in the bar, or the, wait, or maybe that's the mural, sorry, that's the mural um, above. Um, I first saw, this is a shot of a show called Queer and Kinky Danger, that was uh, art of San Francisco's leather SM kink worlds that was um, organized at the Gay and Lesbian, what was then called the Gay and Lesbian Historical Society of Northern California by an archivist now deceased, um, an amazing person named Willie Walker, who drew together some 200 visual and material objects from matchbook covers to psychedelic paintings produced by and for San Francisco's queer sex culture from the 1930s to the 1990s. The exhibition included prints, drawings, photographs, paintings, and sculptures that once decorated the walls of local bars, clubs, and bathhouses, as well as posters, buttons, greeting cards, matchbooks, t-shirts, and banners created for gay and lesbian clubs, parades, parties, contests, auctions, and orgies. Handcrafted or otherwise noteworthy examples of fetish gear and S&M paraphernalia, such as a purple and black flogger with oak tan tails and monster knots on the handle, were also featured within the exhibition. And I'm sorry I don't have a picture of the flogger, but I do have um, a picture of the, the leather. Um, this is the plastic cast of the Deja, the Glenn Deja leather that once uh, stood as the sort of icon welcoming people to see the bar. And this is a, a plastic cast. Warlocks was actually the first motorcycle, gay motorcycle club to include women in its uh, membership. So, um, so I'm just trying to give you a, the smallest taste of this show and thinking and trying to revive uh, queer and kinky danger in the context of free love toolbox. Works such as the David from the Phoebe's Bar or the mural from the Toolbox were created to adorn the interior of gay bars, not to be preserved in an archive or presented in an exhibition at a historical society. And yet it is the unlikely introduction of these objects into archives, 
libraries, historical societies, and museums, uh, or art spaces, that allows them to be seen and studied in the present. In some cases, the material modesty of the objects at issue, a set of matchbox from the toolbox, for example, one of which features George Washington, father of our country, as a leather daddy, retroactively imbues them with historical value and particularity. As Roman suggests, studying the queer past means retooling the methods of scholarly analysis and description in the face of an object as tiny yet unforgettable as a matchbox um, as, a, as a matchbook put, uh, portrait of George Washington as, uh, as a leather man. In light of the limited exhibition space he had to work with, Willie Walker decided to extend Queer and Kinky Danger into the archival storage area of the Historical Society. At the end of one long aisle of storage boxes filled with queer periodicals, scrapbooks, correspondence, and ephemera. So this is actually the storage of what was then the Historical Society. And at the end of that aisle, um, stand, stood a large painting of a man in mirrored sunglasses displaying his muscular body and exposed penis. Walker's catalog text describes the original context for which this painting was produced. Uh, in 19, quote, in 1979, what had been Jack's Turkish baths was redecorated and became the bulldog baths. It featured, among other things, two tiers of jail cells, a standalone bird cage. I don't know exactly how the bird cage would be used, but... Um, and an entire semi-truck in a garage-like setting. The owners hired artist M. Brooks Jones to paint a massive mural on sheetrock of various fantastic sexual scenes. When the Bulldog closed in 1984, several gay historians rescued the panels which made up this mural. And here I'm showing you an ad for the Bulldog Baths from Drummer Magazine in 1979, and then some on-location shots Sorry. Uh, on the jail uh, cell, well, uh, bars. Okay, so I'm just, this is um, the end now. Um, uh, so several, uh, several gay historians, uh, and I'm showing you, okay. Thanks to the salvage operation of a group of queer scholars, and that group included Gail Rubin and Willie Walker, um, the bulldog, panels from the bulldog bath murals uh, have survived survived to resurface in queer and kinky danger. Pictures that once appeared, sorry, pictures that once appeared at the end of the narrow aisles of a gay bathhouse now appeared at the end of the narrow aisles of an archival storage space. As if to make that transition explicit, an illuminated sign reading lockers, there, um, also retrieved from the bulldog baths, extended from the uppermost shelf of the storage racks. And in a sense, those archival boxes uh, in those racks were lockers, but they enclosed not articles of clothing, but documents of social and sexual history. Seeing the panel from the bulldog baths beside all the boxes stacked um, beside it, beside the stacked set of storage boxes, it occurred to me that the panel the, from the painting from the mural could never fit inside one of those boxes. After Queer and Kinky Danger closed in May 1988, several of the remnants from the Bulldog Baths mural, including the half-naked man in sunglasses, were left in place. That is, they were left out on the walls. They were, after all, already in storage. The proximity of the painting and the archival boxes next to it embodies for me um, the relation but also the tension between historical preservation and queer, self queer culture. If the naked man from the bathhouse mural will never fit inside a storage box, neither will he ever conform to the traditional protocols of museum exhibition or academic study. And so one of the things I wanted to think about in closing was how do we historicize or remember a place like the Bulldog Baths? And actually the Uptown Tenderloin Historic District has erected a plaque at 130 Turk Street, which I thought was kind of amazing, um, only in San Francisco, um, where um, in honor of the Bulldog Baths. But for my money, this um, two buck fuck night um, promotional receipt from the Bulldog Baths, and that was Monday night from 4 p.m. to midnight, uh, for two bucks, you, anyway, you get free entry to, uh, uh, to is just as good or maybe better uh, a kind of testimonial to, to the hist history of the baths. Um, 
If the naked man from the bathhouse uh, mural will never fit inside a storage box, neither will he ever conform to the traditional protocols of museum exhibition or academic study. He demands other forms of attention and display, forms which Nayland Blake and Free Love Toolbox help us to imagine and achieve. Thanks. So um, I promise that did you, maybe, maybe we'll find, if there's five minutes, do you think? If there any questions, questions are actually um, my favorite part of something like this because I learn, I know what I said, but I don't know what you heard. And when you ask a question, I get a sense of what actually was heard. So just anything at all. Just give me something. Yes. <laughs> Dela? <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. I remember, and I, Ma Martin, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I remember when Martin was working on the dissertation or the book, I think that it was fairly challenging, right? I thought, to get the rights to reproduce those photographs. And you can also, oh sorry. You could also buy, like I did on eBay, um, the issue, although I think it's now getting more expensive as more people learn about it. Right. <laughs> well, thank you for listening, and I uh, look forward to, sh to now being part of the audience for the performance. I think we're going to take a break, right? About 15 minutes?